Good morning, everybody. Today is Saturday, October 1st. Rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. You are watching or listening to another edition of Forward Maryland. My name is Bill Woodcock. Steve Hunt will not be with us today. He is tending to a family emergency. And so we wish uh, Steve and his, and his uh, family uh, very well today. Uh, but with us is rescheduled from a couple of weeks ago to talk about the topic of ranked choice voting and who knows nothing else is scheduled on the agenda but sometimes these things tend to diverge is the uh legendary the great the mythic president and founder of Tred avon strategies coming to us live from cambridge maryland today it's the one and only len foxwell len good morning bill good morning to you sir so Normally with Steve, and as, I'm, as a, you know, because you're, you're a, you're a multi-time, you know, podcast guest, uh, you know, we have, we have a little pithy banter. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to engage you in the pithy banter for the day. So as you know, well, no, you probably don't know, but I like to think that I model our podcast after, pardon the interruption, a lot of longer form blather blather you know not for a 25 minute uh show but kornheiser and wilbon are, are are kind of you know what i try to shoot for so they had a terrific question that they bandered back and forth and i'm interested in your opinion i'll be happy to share mine what baseball milestone this week was the most monumental albert kuhls getting the 700 home runs or Aaron Judge hitting 61? The most monumental of the two? Um, I think, obviously there are two, I think they are different in scope. Uh, and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be equivocal. I'm not trying to be lawyerly. Obviously, one is speaks to a cumulative body of work, and the other is a single season milestone of, of almost singular excellence. I think that if I had if I had to put, put my finger on one, it would be Pujols getting to seven hundred. I, I you know because uh, you know simply because. Uh, and I don't think Aaron. I don't think Aaron Judge's performance uh, this year is necessarily anomalous. He has been an elite power hitter for several years in, in the league. Uh, you know, he hasn't begun to assemble his hall. He has. He's not a borderline Hall of Famer yet, but he's only thirty years old, so he has plenty of time to build out his cumulative body of work and be in that conversation at the end of his career. But you know, Roger Maris, for instance who by all accounts was a wonderful person, he is by all accounts the current legitimate record holder. I discount Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa. The true record is held by Roger Maris, who while he was a two-time most valuable player, is not regarded typically as, as one of the game's all-time greats. Not even a Hall of Famer. Not even a Hall of Famer, correct. So that by, by however, by the time you reach 700 i mean the the only two legitimate 700 home run candidate home run uh hitters in the game's history are babe ruth and hank aaron you know the greatest the greatest baseball player who ever lived in babe ruth and in my estimation the greatest right-handed hitter who ever lived in hank aaron so the, by the time you get to 700 you are in extraordinarily Olympian real estate. So if, I mean, I don't want to discount from either one. I think of the two, Albert Pujols hitting 700 because it is a career mark and not a single season mark. I very well could have argued the other side on this just to create some, some, some dissension in the ranks. Uh, but I agree with you. I, I go with Albert Pujols 700. Now, also, to, to and, and I think equiv equivocation is perfectly acceptable here. Both achievements are amazing. Right. Uh, but to your point, 
Um, Aaron Judge has several years in his prime as a power hitter. I would dare say at least five um, minimum. And, you know, depending on health, it could be as many as eight to ten. Um, where he can amass, you know, incredible home run totals in his career and, and can, in fact, you know, in threaten uh, 714 and, and even the, the uh, wayward, you know, what is it, 756 that Bonds has or whatever. I don't even know the number, yeah. 768. So, you know, so Aaron's... Um, no, no, no clue. Yeah. But, but with Pujols... Albert Pujols has been playing baseball since, I don't know, maybe we were both about 30. I mean, maybe, maybe early 30s. So if, if, I, recall, if, I, if I recall correctly, his, he, he broke in with the Cardinals in 2000. Okay. So we were in our early 30s. That's right. And, and so to, and, and also the impressiveness of his feet this year because he only started September with, I think, eight or nine home runs. And now he has 24. Uh, so he is going out on a high note. Um, also, to your point, um, I, you know, I, I think Aaron Judge will wind up in the Hall of Fame one day. And the Yankees will have yet another damn plaque of a retired number to stick on their wall. But uh, Pujols is already there. And, so, and, and then the last thing I will state is and this makes um to me Pujols's achievement this kind of sinks the sinks the um argument not again not that there should be much argument um the way the game has changed the game has changed because I agree with you I have to discount the bonds and you know uh a rod and they're you know they're exceeding 700 you know, approaching 700, et cetera. Um, but the game is no longer fastball curveball. Uh, the game is not, you know, power, you know, power pitchers who come in and throw 30 perfect games. I mean, 30 perfect games. Yeah, 30 complete games a year. Um, the game has changed to this one of wicked specialization on the terms in terms of pitching. Uh, pitchers who can master five and six pitchers in their repertoire, uh, you know, at, at, before, before the new rule, you know, single batter pitchers. Um, the game has become a lot more strategic and a lot less straight at you, which was certainly where it was in the 30s and I would also say the 70s. And so to um, still remain a masterful power hitter at the age of 43 and reach this threshold, I think it's pretty amazing. It's been you know? a terrific story. It really has, Bill. And I, I jokingly told a friend a couple of weeks ago that every, every uh, national network uh, affiliate or every, every national network should suspend regular programming and tune into Albert Pujols' at-bats because not only – has he been chasing this as you as we're discussing here the singular achievement uh that really ha that has not been legitimately approached since henry aaron in uh in the early 1970s and on route to hitting 756 lifetime home runs uh but it's such a great human interest story i mean he, mm -hmm. was, he was absolutely beloved in st louis he is a st louis icon grew up in missouri uh, attended community college in Missouri but before being drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals, went away to Anaheim, fell far short of expectations, I believe, just be, you know, he wasn't bad, but he wasn't the true Albert Pujols that we saw in St. Louis. And now he's coming back for this, the twilight of his career. And he was expected to be just a, a, a tertiary part of that mm -hmm. roster, you know, more of a, more of a, uh, a, a gate attraction than anything else and he has been at times in this late summer and early fall the hottest right-handed hitter in the national league and it has been just an amazing resurgence and it really is a hollywood farewell that someone of his caliber deserves yeah yeah kornheiser said on on pti and then in the show i and the episode I, I where this came from why not one more year no no mm. 
No, this is it. This is Ray Lewis, Peyton Manning going out on top. Just John to, Elway. John Elway, you know, let it, let it, let ride into the sunset. And I think there's something to be said for leave, you know, leave while they're still clapping. And if you look at, there's nothing sadder than some of the memories of our heroes hanging on in mediocrity, in strange uniforms, toiling for an additional paycheck. I remember being in uh, at Memorial Stadium in 1987, watching a meaningless game between the Orioles and the Cleveland, the then Cleveland Indians and seeing Steve Carlton, who arguably is one of the three greatest left-handed pitchers who ever played the game, coming out of the bullpen for the Cleveland Indians in middle relief, far removed from his glory days with the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, just hanging on for both financial and personal reasons. And it was depressing. And, and we, we, there are countless examples of that throughout all sports. And... I think this is the way we want to frame Albert Pujols in our minds in that familiar Cardinal red hitting home runs, being a major contributor to another playoff team in St. Louis playing in front of sellout crowds. That's what we want to see Albert. That's how we want to remember it. Not toiling in some odd, you know, Marlins uniform at the end of the bench or something. At the eight, uh, a memory of mine at the age of six is watching the game of the week on NBC and watching a New York Mets center fielder named Willie Mays chase fly balls all around center field and, and listening to Kurt Gowdy and whoever else it was talk about how he just can't do what he used to do anymore yeah. and wondering how he was ever a good mm -hmm. baseball player. Yeah. So, I yeah. Agree with you. yeah. So very creative segue because we're talking about the baseball hall of fame, the baseball hall of fame elects its members through a process we could otherwise call ranked choice voting. Well done. Len. <laughs> Glenn, you have, um, amongst your, your, your many other um, um, endeavors, you have been a very staunch advocate during this 2022 election season of ranked choice voting, which does not exist that much in the state of Maryland. I believe it exists in elections in Tacoma Park. That is I'm not sure where else it might exist. It is actually a thing that I can remember poo-pooing in the past. Um, however, with the recent special election of the Democratic candidate over Sarah Palin in uh, Alaska, the congressional election, um, and with some other recent results in the, uh, in the country, um, it's actually become nearer and dearer to our hearts and minds. And so, you know, we're glad you're here to uh, talk about it. For the viewers and listeners out there uh, who may not know, tell us a little bit about what ranked choice voting is and how it works. Sure. Well, Bill, thank you for the opportunity. And I really began to take a look at this issue because, you know, as, as you know, and as we've discussed many times, I teach a course in uh, civic and political engagement at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I teach a professional writing class and I, I, you know, the curriculum that I have built that course around is uh, strategies or strategies to uh, re-engage uh, an apathetic political electorate. And you know, it occurred to me looking at data that we, we're kind of on the, we're kind of facing a conundrum here in the state of Maryland in as much as we have more means of voting, we have more lanes to political participation than ever before. Yet, uh, relative to past decades, 80s and the 90s in particular, and even the early part of the, this new millennium, voter participation in our primary elections here in the state of Maryland is considerably lower than it used to be. And so I started to really kind of look at that because it seems counterintuitive, right, Bill? That you would think that uh, allowing same-day voter registration, for right. instance, or allowing mail-in voting, 
uh, having a seven day early voting period where you can go to the polls, not just on election day, but for seven days prior to the election, cast your ballot, you would think that by expanding access to the ballot box, you would increase voter participation and that hasn't materialized. And so I figured there has to be something else going on here. And what, what, what the research invariably draws my attention to is that uh, people aren't, despite the increased access to the polls, people just aren't participating because they are disenchanted with the political process. Mm -hmm. Candidates are too extreme. Uh, the parties have become dominated by their respective left and right polls, mm -hmm. uh, you know, LES, not, you know, survey research polls. Right. Um, uh, the campaigns are insubstantial. Uh, the candidates are too negative. And so despite that we're giving people increased opportunities to vote, we're not giving people uh, anything to vote for. And until we attack that, I don't think we're going to see the robust democracy that we've been hoping for. And so combined, or combined reporting, so ranked choice, I'm getting my wires crossed here. So ranked choice voting is a really innovative idea that's being done in states and in local elections across the country. And uh, it could also be described for simplicity as an instant runoff. So we have five, so we have, let's say we have a, a democratic primary with five candidates on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And so instead of Len Foxwell and Bill Woodcock going to the polls and just uh, voting for the one candidate of our choice, we actually get to rank these candidates in order of preference. Mm -hmm. You know, one, two, three, four, and five. And, uh, and so as the votes are tabulated, uh, the lowest finisher, the fifth place finisher, is eliminated from further contention. Mm -hmm. That candidate's votes that candidate's second place votes get redistributed to the top four finishers. And then once the retabulation occurs, the fourth candidate is eliminated and that candidate's second place votes get redistributed to the top three. And that process repeats itself until one candidate hits a, the 50% threshold. So, and so parenthetically, I should say that if a candidate, it typically in, in ranked choice voting, if a candidate hits a 50% threshold right off the bat, the election is over. Sure. The, the, the candidate with the majority has won. The, the scenario I'm describing here is when no one has a clear majority, uh, merely, you know, merely a plurality under 50, under 50%. And so, this does a couple of things. First and foremost, it makes the voting process more attractive to people like you and I, because it makes our votes more consequential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even if we, you know, even if we feel that, you know, my goodness, I want to vote for John Smith, but I don't think John, I like John Smith, his platform appeals to me but I don't think he has a chance to win. We're no longer forced to choose between our, our pragmatic and emotional side. We can actually vote for John Smith, but then make a pragmatic choice with our second place vote, mm -hmm. knowing that that second place vote will be pivotal to the outcome. Mm -hmm. You know, so it makes, it, it, it makes our votes count more than they do right now. And it eliminates that, that, on a, on, unappetizing choice between voting for the candidate we like and voting for the candidate we think might win. It also uh, forces candidates to appeal to a broader spectrum of voters because no longer can you do the Sarah Palin or uh, you know the uh, you know, picks you know the Alexandra Ocasio Cortez route and just appeal to that that relatively uh, narrow sliver of extreme base voters that you need to win a party primary. You have to not only compete 
for those who think that you are the best candidate, you have to really uh, broaden your appeal so that you show up as a second place choice, a second choice on a number of ballots across the field. Mm -hmm. And so that really does incentivize candidates to develop a, a broader, more well-rounded, and I would actually suggest a more moderate message. Mm -hmm. Number three, go, go ahead. Sorry. And then the third, uh, real quick, the third is that it will, uh, experience has shown that it incentivizes positive campaigns because candidates have to reach out and forge alliances uh, with other candidates, with other campaigns. And rather than speaking ill of another candidate, uh, actually speak positively and build levels of agreement because you want to be that second, or you want to be second place, the second place choice among that candidate's voters. And mm -hmm. so all of which means that bottom line, you get, you get a more engaged electorate, you get better candidates running more substantive, more positive campaigns. And all of this co combined, I think actually leads to a more robust political process and a healthier democracy. And I think it's something that's whose time has come. So, so let me ask some fairly obvious questions because people, you know, react negatively to something that's unfamiliar. That's human nature. Somebody who doesn't want to vote, given your example, for all five candidates in the primary, they could still just vote for their first one or for their first two or three, correct? Correct. I mean, for some people, you know, we call it bulleting. Uh, mm -hmm. The bullet strategy, uh, that's, that's, that's your prerogative. Um, mm -hmm. And people still do that. Yes. And what would do you think the effect be on, you know, you mentioned um, having to campaign through uh, through the broad spectrum of of uh, ideology in a particular party, or in the case of a general, even an electric. How do you think, or do you think there would be any effect on? Um, you know, that, that, that bugaboo we all know too well of, of campaign fundraising and campaign financing, um, moving towards a ranked choice system? That's a really good question. That's an excellent question, actually, Bill. And I've actually given that some thought. Uh, in as much as it, it opens up the political system to a broader, a broader array of candidates, uh, because you know, now in this system, more of the candidates in the, you know, there, whereas in the past, maybe one candidate had a clear track to his or her party's nomination. Now uh, it's a less predictable outcome and victory may accrue to the candidate who actually has the broadest coalition and not just the most passionate base. Uh, it actually might uh, incentivize campaign donors to spread the money in a more in a broader, more equitable manner. Mm -hmm. And then the last question I'll ask will be not so much before uh, I share our opinions and we banner is not so much a primary function, but a general election function. You know, um, my friend and former co-host Jason Booms loves him his bread and roses party which I, I believe is still a registered party in the state of Maryland. But for, uh, for those of us voting in the gubernatorial election in November, if we were under a ranked choice system, uh, and I'm not completely up as to what parties are registered in the state of Maryland right now, but one could rank um, Westmore number one, um, Bread and Roses candidate number two, um, Green Party candidate number three, Libertarian candidate number four, and Dan Cox number five. And so to my earlier point I just made about campaign financing, those minor parties who are woefully underfinanced would be met oh, to the outcome with additional, much more additional election 
power through ranked choice voting. Would that not be true? No, of course. Yeah, I mean, these, you know, and, and just, just an earlier point of correction, I don't think the Bread and Roses Party exists anymore. And I only say this because Jerome Siegel, uh, who was the 2018 Bread and Roses Party nominee, unsuccessfully sought the 2022 uh, gubernatorial nomination. <laughs> He did, but Jason, I, I, you know, I got to hold out a torch for Jason. Jason loved him, his bread and loves him, his bread and roses party. Hell, he might be the nominee for all I know. I'm not even sure. Yeah, I had a history professor or a history teacher back in eighth grade who was uh, valiantly holding out for the restoration of the Whigs. So I, I do have. Uh, I know we just had a Whig president. <laughs> we did just have one really well i think there's uh, some people who think that uh, that president was wearing a wig um well that too a wig and a wig <laughs> no but, but no you're right i mean and and i'll be completely candid bill mm -hmm. i think the rank when i advocate for rank choice i think that the model is more effective and it's more of a practical thing for primary elections, uh, which is where we tend to see uh, political radicalism, extremism, um, you know, rear, rear its head and where, and where uh, the left and right extremes in both parties tend to have a disproportionate influence because of very low turnout. Having said that, yes, should we, should we decide at some point to uh, contemplate ranked choice voting for a general. Yes, these secondary and third tier parties could that you know that get you know basis points of one percent or one point eight percent or something in the at the final tally, they could actually prove consequential to the outcome. Yeah, nobody ever votes for them because they they know what's the number one reason they can't mm -hmm. win. But under this sort of a scenario, it would be possible. And I bring it up because. It was a general election scenario in Alaska. Of course, there was a little, you know, there were four candidates and there were two of each party, um, you know, and so that's the way that worked. But Lynn, I, you know, and, and I actually applied the, when I put my thinking cap on and did my deeper dive into thinking about ranked choice voting, I, I thought about my own experience and, and way back when, and, you know, when I was, 31 and fresh faced and ran for the House of Delegates against the top two Republicans in the Maryland General Assembly. Um, you know, one was very liked, one was very much not liked uh, within district. And I could have seen a lot of places where I could have, you know, voters could have walked into a booth and said, well, this fella, you know, this guy's been a long standing delegate, you know done good by me. I'm going to vote for him. But I like this young fella. You know, I like this Woodcock. He's a Democrat, but I'm, you know, I like him. And I don't so much like this other guy. Um, and I could see where that, where that could have, you know, I'm not saying it would have changed my life, but I am saying that it creates, I see this creating opportunity. And Len, I don't know if you've ever heard these four words in politics, but I think these four words that get used a lot in politics would go away if we had a ranked choice voting system. And those four words are lesser of two evils. Yeah. I mean, to me, this seems like a very empowering system. Uh, it does require, although it doesn't mandate, that the electorate become more knowledgeable about the people who are volunteering their time and energy to serve in office. Why don't you think that, I mean, it's almost a no brainer. Um, why do you think that this process has been slow to catch on in Maryland? Although it is picking up elsewhere. Has it been simply no one's talked about it or is there more? Because the status quo works very, very well for those who are already in, period, full stop. For this, to, uh, for this system to become the, 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 me the mechanism by which we you know, hold our primary or general elections, 
we would need legislation. And I, I've asked that, I've, pre, I've presented that question to the State Board of Elections. You know, is this something that the parties could simply mandate uh, or would we need- uh, Would it not be a constitutional amendment? No, then wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be a constitutional amendment. It would just, it would need, there would need to be legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and so it'd have to go through the General Assembly. And these are obviously, by definition, people who have been elected and reelected in some cases, many, many times over under the system we have right now. And so this system, the current system, the status quo works just fine. And so for this to occur, I think we would be asking, I think we would be asking uh, lawmakers to give up the two things that are most important to many politicians, which is predictability and control, which is why I think that we're not gonna see it start at the state level, I think we're going to see more municipalities follow the lead of Tacoma Park and show that, you know, you know, and demonstrate the positive outcomes that you do have more moderate candidates with a better rounded message, uh, running more positive campaigns, forging coalitions with other candidates, exactly what Mary Patola did in her congressional race in Alaska by mm -hmm. reaching across the aisle and winning just enough Republican votes so that she, the Democrat, could beat Sarah Palin. I think it's going to start, as many good innovations do, at the municipal level. And eventually, people are going to say, why aren't we doing this uh, in legislative races, in congressional races? Because we like, uh, we like our vote counting for more than it does today. And we like better campaigns. We like better candidates and we'll be more motivated to vote. Mm -hmm. Something has to happen. Um, the system right now just isn't working for people. No, and I mean, look, I mean, we're both uh, veterans of the political wars. And, um, you know, I can remember 2018, wasn't that long ago, right? and all the anger and all the, we need to get this crap to, you know changed and we need to get this out of here and you know we need to you know elect a better class of people because our political system is sick on both sides of the equation and yeah and i'll just stick to my own native county of howard um you know because there were a lot of seats up for election and delegate seats in all of our districts were, were, were well contested in the primary. Uh, there were some, you know, uh, hot uh, ca ca county council primary races. Steve was part of one of them. And uh, what happened? Uh, we had a terrific new state senator elected who was her first time running for office named Katie Hester. And we barely had a new county council member elected named Liz Walsh, who, you know, both ran on kind of, you know, outsider who knows how to make good, you know, who know how to do work and get the work of the people done uh, campaign platforms. And all of those other people, who brought great experience, non-traditional backgrounds for people serving in public office. Um, you know, not, didn't just lose, but lose bad. And many of them got turned around right back out of wanting to serve in, in, in or even run in public office again. So one has to think that for a discerning electorate, and I can remember this in many a campaign that I've been involved in. When people have said at doors, oh, I wish I could vote for more than right. one person or two people, that this would be an option to do that. And it would allow for a greater diversity of thought in the General Assembly, which I think in turn would help cure some of the internal ills that befit the Maryland General Assembly. 
Um, but to your point, to ask legislators to legislate themselves less power is almost analogous to asking them to, you know, electrocute themselves. Well, let's talk, let's talk about a couple of tangible examples of where ranked choice voting would create a better outcome. This past year, uh, we saw in Montgomery County, Mark Elrich, a, the incumbent county executive who in 2018 was elected by a, the grand total of 77 votes above his second place finisher, a guy named David Blair. He won with a 29-29% plurality. And that was a year where there were multiple candidates who had, you know, I'm talking about people like Bill Frick and Roger Berliner and Rose Krasnow and Blair, who were more moderate, middle of the road, had more traditional center, center left um, political views. And one candidate on the far left, Mark Elrich, and he pinpointed his base and wrung every last vote out of his narrow constituency and straight by with 29% of the vote. Had ranked choice voting been the modus operandi in Montgomery County in 2018, there was virtually no chance that Mark Elrich ever would have been elected county executive because David Blair voters would have picked anybody but Elrich as the second as their second choice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and consequently, the same is true. People, you know, the last place finisher was Bill Frick, our mm -hmm. former delegate. His second place, his second place votes would have gone to Blair in all likelihood. Krasn uh, Berliner's votes would have gone largely to Blair, and he would have been the county executive. This year, uh, Elrich won by only 32 votes over Blair with 39%. Uh, and again, there was a third candidate in the race, Montgomery County Councilman Hans Riemer, who clouded the outcome by pulling votes from one person or the other, uh, whereas, you know, again, had ranked choice voting been the order of the day, Blair in all likelihood would have won. It also would create better candidates because candidates would emerge from the primary and would go into the general uh, with a, a clearer mandate from his or her party. Mm -hmm. we're, we're watching Wes Moore right now, who is an incredible candidate. I mean, he is effervescent, he is charismatic, he is brilliant. Um, and, um, but he only won his primary with a 32% a plurality, a 15,000 vote margin over Tom Perez. I think it could be argued, and I will argue, that he would be going into the general election in a far better position had he shown up on, on enough Democratic primary ballots as either the first or the second choice to have emerged with more than 50% of the vote. Yeah, I, I, I could not agree more, and, and uh, no pun intended. I mean, yeah, I, I actually game planned that out too. And that was the next point I was going to make. I mean, you know, probably on my ballot, he would have been, well, he definitely would have been either the second or the third. Right. He was not the person I voted for, but he would have been one of those two. And, and um, you know, let's hope that, you know, in five weeks, things come out as they should. And um you know, the Goucher poll result turns out to be reality. And hopefully that was a minimum margin that the Goucher poll showed and not a, not a maximum margin. But, um, but, but, but it is a minor talking point amongst the other side that, oh, only 32% of Democrats even like this guy, uh, which is not true. Right. I'm a Democrat who likes Lewis more just fine. I just didn't vote for him in the primary. Uh, and I will vote for him in the general, but it does kill that argument. And I do believe getting back to your other point, Len, um, you know, uh, political parties in general need to stop shooting themselves in the foot. And the way to do that, I think, and it's been shown time and time again in our current system is by an informed electorate 
uh, saying, no, we're not going to do this anymore. You know, no matter how much, you know, I mean, there have been many, many cases of no matter how much money or how much endorsement or whatever in, in, you know, now uh, most times people do get elected who have the most toys and most resources, but there have also been a lot of times where people turn away from that and they get turned off. And that brings us back full circle to your original point. So an engaged and informed electorate can help move mountains more so than a lot of us who are arguing for various types of political reform could ever do. But this, I do believe that this is a reform that, that should be coming to the state. And I think it'll long-term serve to modernize our entire political structure. And I hope you're right about how it would bubble up. Uh, that's that's really well said, and and you know, and in making this call for this particular reform, I'm not denigrating or minimizing at all the steps that the General Assembly has taken to uh, improve public access to uh, to participation in our elections. It's absolutely essential to make it easier and more convenient than ever for people to have their say. I think this is the natural. This is the second part of the equation. I think that I think this is a two step process. One is by one is to make the ballot box more accessible. And the other is to provide the electorate with better campaigns and better candidates. Mm -hmm. And so these are these are two sides of these are two lanes toward the same positive outcome. Mm -hmm. And Len, as always, it has been a pleasure to talk with you. I, I do have to ask you a minor, if not personal question. It looks like you have some sort of, not a lightsaber, but a light sickle behind you. Exactly what is that, sir? That is a, that is a light. That's a reading light uh, that I have um, that I, I just, I, I love it. Uh, I, I, and I, if it is, Visually distracting for you and your no, it's years. great. Um, but I, I I love it because it is it's it's extremely adjustable uh, as opposed to a lamp, which is a you know is very stationary vertical. Uh, I can kind of make an adjustment uh, you know to the left to the right if I depending on how I'm sitting. Uh, okay, so that's not like one continuous light. That's not all a bulb is what I'm, where I'm going. No, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, like an art deco lamp. I absolutely love it. And it's not distracting at all. In fact, it's quite striking. So, so no, but when I saw it, I was like, has Len gone Jedi? Is he getting ready to go out and slice evildoers on the streets of Cambridge this evening? Is Snapper safe tonight because it is under Len Foxwell's protection? Len Skywalker hitting RAR uh, <laughs> to do wage battle for the perfect you know, West Coast hazy IPA. <laughs> Indeed a quest. So I will leave you to it, sir, for, and leave you to your Saturday. And, uh, and, and for those of you who have not gotten enough Len Foxwell, Len will be on in the month of November in an extra special themed episode, which we're keeping under wraps, but Steve and I will probably talk about it next week. I am looking Not, forward to it, my friend. Cannot wait for that one. That one's going to be a blast. Well, and I, and I will uh, put in a plug for a couple of Howard County's best breweries. I was out in, uh, I, I was out in Howard County recently talking with a prospective client that I was very fortunate and blessed to have signed. And I had it afforded me the chance to not only visit Manor Hill Farm, owned by the incomparable Randy Mariner. Yes, yes, uh, they the, are. They had a great family there. The bane of the the bane of Joan Pontius's existence, uh, as well as uh, <laughs> uh, as well as Sapwood Cellars, who is consistently putting out some of the best beer in the state of Maryland right now. So Sapwood is a is a treasure, and and not a lot of people know about it. But I have a feeling that that's going to increase rapidly. Well, you should. We should conduct a ranked choice election for Howard Countyans to choose their best brewery at some point. I think the results would be illuminating. 
Much better than the crap they run in Howard Magazine. Indeed. Glenn, always a pleasure. And uh, thank you out there and viewer and listening land for uh, joining us for this episode of Forward Maryland. Steve and I will come at you next weekend. Until then, take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Bill.